We're at 16, Pam? Six, I think 16 is broken up. So, because mine's saying 16, but in parentheses two and three, maybe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. B yes, because yesterday was 16, too. Well, 16, part, one. 16, part one, yeah. yeah. Oh, this is, this is a, I see why it's broken up. This is long. Okay. All right, I'll end our week in a nice long one. <laughs> okay. So verse 16, two and three, nonviolence, truth, non-stealing, continence, continence, being absorbed in a pure state of consciousness, forgiveness, endurance, compassion, humility, moderate diet, and cleanliness are the 10 rules of conduct, yama. Penance, mm -hmm. austerity, contentment, belief, faith, in the supreme charity, worship of God, listening to the recitations of sacred scriptures, modesty, a disallearning intellect, japa, mantra repetition, and sacrifice are the 10 observances, niyama. The 10 rules of conduct and 10 observances called yama and niyama, are listed in Raja Yoga, but Hatha Yoga does not place much emphasis on them. Raja Yoga claims that yama and niyama must be practiced before commencing Hatha Yoga. It says, control the mind, then purify the body. But in this day and age, too many problems can arise if an aspirant comes into direct confrontation with his mind at the beginning of his spiritual quest. It is like running from a den of lions into a cage of tigers. Therefore, in Hatha Yoga, the whole system has been designed for the people of Kali Yuga. Hatha Yoga commences with purification of the body, the Shat Karmas, then come Asana and Pranayama. Yama and Niyama can be practiced later when the mind has become stable and outward going tendencies can be controlled. Here, Swat Marma is merely listen, listing what is required from a sadhaka at a later stage of practice. He has mentioned the ways in which yoga can be enhanced and the factors can be led to failure. The yama and niyama are given to verify why he states these causes. So there may be very there may be a little repetition on certain points. Swat Marma also advises not to adhere to rules. Yama and Niyama are rules, and to an extent, they are also moral codes. Initially, it is not essential to practice these, and it, is not, and it should not be thought that you cannot succeed without them. The Yama and Niyama have been given as guidelines to keep a sadhaka on the path. The first Yama is ahimsa, or nonviolence. To remain passive in any situation without the desire to harm anyone or anything, either physically, emotionally, psychologically, or psychically. In India, the Jain sect is very firm in this code of conduct. They even sweep the pathway before them so they will not step on any insect and kill it. They strain all their drinking water and cut their vegetables scrumptiously so that no form of life can be injured. Ahimsa means not acting with the will to violate anything, even the atmosphere. Harmony and serenity have to be maintained. There is no need to place any religious connotation on the word ahimsa. It is a process of self-control, self-awareness, and awareness of everything that is around you. If you harm another person intentionally and you lose control of your mind and actions, you are creating an imbalance in yourself. Violence means moving away from your true nature. Ahimsa means coming closer to the pure spirit. Mahatma Gandhi was a living example of this doctrine. Honesty is something we rarely find in this modern world of corruption, and it is definitely something which needs to be cultivated and instilled again. If you make a habit of fooling or cheating others, you start to believe the lies yourself. You are only being dishonest with yourself. Basically, honesty means being truthful with yourself and not aiming to cheat others for your own personal game or do or to discredit them. 
Non-stealing is easy to understand, not taking what doesn't belong to you, not only for social or moral reasons, but to avoid psychological or karmic repercussions. Stealing breeds guilt. In yoga, we are trying to release the complexes and some scars from our mind and personality, so we really do not want to create anymore. If you need something and it is truly essential, somehow it will come to you. Continence or brahmacharya is the next yama. Generally, brahmacharya is considered to be abstention from sexual involvement or relationships. Some people even go as far as having absolutely no contact with the opposite sex, neither talking nor looking at a woman or man. However, this is not the true meaning of brahmacharya. Brahmacharya is the combination of two words, brahman, pure consciousness, and charya, one who's, who moves. Therefore, it means one who lives in constant awareness of Brahman, one whose awareness is absorbed in pure consciousness, whose mind is above the duality of male and female, who sees the Atman in all. One who is in constant communion with the Atma is the Brahmachari. A true Brahmachari can be involved in sexual relationships and maintain awareness of only the supreme experience. Passions do not arise in the mind when he or she comes in contact with the opposite sex. In yoga and tantra, they explain this as maintaining the bindu, i.e. not losing the bindu or semen. The bindu has to be kept in the brain center where it is produced. It should not flow out through the sexual organs, and if it does, it should be drawn back. For this purpose, there are many yogic techniques which curb the production of the sex hormones hormones and restructure, restructure the reproductive organs. Yoga influences the whole endocrine system by regulating the pineal, the pineal and pituitary glands. Brahmacharya was generally taken to mean absten abstention from sexual activity because by refraining from sexual stimulation, sexual impulses and the production of sex hormones are reduced. Sexual abstinence may be necessary in the beginning while you are trying to gain mastery over the body and mind. But once you have managed this, you can maintain awareness of the higher reality. Sexual interaction is no barrier. In fact, in Tantra, it is never said that sexual interactions are detrimental to spiritual awakening. On the contrary, Tantra says that sec the sexual act can be used to induce spiritual awakening. By avoiding sexual contact, one does not automatically become a brahmachari. You may abstain from sexual interaction for 30 or 40 years and still not be a brahmachari. If your mind is haunted by sexual fantasies or you have an uncontrollable loss of semen, even, when you are, even while avoiding any sort of contact, then you are definitely not a brahmachari. You are suppressing and causing frustration, and this will do more harm than good. Therefore, in Hatha Yoga, there are special techniques which aid in brahmacharya by regulating hormon hormonal secretions and the functioning of the glands. Sexual thoughts and desires are then curbed. After all, what causes sexual motivation? A chemical reaction in the brain and body, or let us say, hormones. Control of the hormones induces true brahmacharya. When the bindu is retained in the brain center, sexual urges are controlled and the mind can remain absorbed in awareness of the supreme. This is real brahmacharya. The next yama is forgiveness or kashama. Forgiveness actually means the ability to let go, to let experience go from the mind and not to hold on to memories of past events. It means living in the present. This yama is not only for the sake of other people, it is more for your own benefit. If you can forgive, life becomes more pleasant and harmonious. Whereas revenge brings anger and remorse and creates karma, forgiveness brings happiness and lightness to your heart. Swatmarama so has already discussed endurance. He called it perseverance. The trials and tribulations of life are arduous and painful, but they have a positive purpose. If you cannot endure ordinary mundane experiences, how will you cope with the Atma how you cope when the Atma reveals itself. A spiritual experience can occur at any moment and you have to be prepared to sustain it on every level. It is not just something which happens to the spirit and leaves the body and mind unaffected. 
One has to be ever alert and constant in both practice and aspiration. Even if the whole world collapses around you, it does not matter. If you give up hope and effort, you can never be successful. The divine power is gracious to devotees and disguises itself in many forms just to test their devotion and faith. When we give up hope and belief because the odds seem to have turned against us, we have misunderstood the situation. Due to our concepts of good and bad, we assume that a particular experience is negative and react to it. However, whether circumstances seem to be pleasant or unpleasant, we must maintain faith and continue our practice. Only then can sadhana bear fruit. Compassion is kindness to the young and old, rich and poor, worthy and seemingly unworthy. We are all of the one Atma. Cruelty to others ultimately rebounds on us. Kindness to others brings divine mercy. If you open your heart to the divine energy and you can feel compassion for every creature, you will make quick progress in your search for the Atma. Swatmarama previous, has previously described humility as modesty. Spontaneous humility comes with divine awareness and surrender of the ego or I awareness. It is ego which creates the feeling of separation from the Atma and prevents us from feeling the inner being. Those like Swami Sivananda of Rikish, Rishikesh and many other great saints who have found unity in the Atma were as meek as small children. Humbleness or meekness means simplicity of character and lifestyle. The soul needs no lavish accessories, food or praises, and when you seek them, they pull you away from your true identity. Moderation in diet means neither overeating or undereating. It means eating sparingly but comfortably filling the stomach and meeting the requirements of the body. Thus, body and mind remain healthy and balanced. A weak body cannot support a strong mind. A strong and healthy body reflects the nature of the mind. Overeating and greediness for food shows an uncontrolled mind. Your diet should be simple, pure, and not overspiced. Eat what is necessary to maintain your bodily requirements and choose a diet which will, do the, which will be most conducive for your sadhana. However, do not become too food conscious. The last of the yamas is cleanliness in your whole lifestyle, keeping the body and mind in a pure state. When the body is clean and there are no blockages, it can become a perfect vessel for divine energy and pure consciousness. Not only should the internal body be clean, so should the surroundings in which you live. To clean the body internally, Hatha Yoga prescribes the six cleansing techniques. Neti, Dhoti, Noli, Basti, Kapalabhati, and Chataka. These ten yamas are followed by the ten niyamas. The first is tapa, which means to heat, and also refers to austerities. There are three types of tapas. Sharik, physical, vakik, vocal, and manasik mental, which may again be sophic, rajic, or tamasic. In the past, tapas meant standing in cold water on one foot for hours at a time or wearing a loin cloth in the freezing cold and such like. However, these methods are necessary for spiritual evolution and actually they do not help people of this age to come any closer to self-realization. They will only cause physical discomfort and possibly diseases like rheumatism, arthritis, etc., and disbelief in the path of self-evolution. These austerities might help, may help strengthen the mind, but there are other less severe methods of doing this. Austerities for people of this age involve doing these thing, those things which test the willpower and strength of the mind and body. If you are getting up at 7 a.m., and if you change this habit and make yourself get up at 4 a.m., this is tapas. Once you are accustomed to it, it no longer remains an austerity. Austerity is doing away with comforts and luxuries, such as a 10-inch foam, 10-inch thick foam mattress, expensive clothing, tasty food, television, air conditioner, and heater, and involves taking cold baths in winter, doing tasks 
which you do not like, etc. Once you adjust to such conditions, they no longer remain austerities for you. These processes mold the body and mind into a pure and more sophic state, and they help in spiritual growth. Contentment or santosha means developing the sense of satisfaction in any situation. Whatever may come to you, whether you have a lot or nothing, if you gain or lose, you should try to feel that you have more than enough. The opposite of this is insecurity, which creates restlessness and unsteadiness. Definitely, we are all searching for something. Most find contentment in material fulfillment, but, why, but after a while, discontent arises. When you realize that desires can never be satisfied, it is time to search for fulfillment in spirit. This is the only way a true feel, a true, this is the only way to truly feel santosha or satisfaction. Belief in the Supreme or Astikyam is the same as faith. Some people call the Supreme God. Of course, God is not a man sitting in heaven on a throne. Life and creation are very systematic and scientific. You may call the cosmic power God, nature, or supreme consciousness, but definitely a higher force exists and controls all lower existences. Some people have been able to experience the existence and operation of the supreme, and it is the right of everyone to expand their consciousness to such a state. We can only maintain faith that one day we too shall have this experience. Even an agnostic believes in something. He, maybe he disagrees with religion, but he cannot say that he does not believe in a force greater than his own mind and body. He cannot deny the facts of science and nature, and although he will always try to deny the existence of God, he will still seek facts to prove his non-existence or to confirm his own existence. So he is also searching for the higher experience. We are all just, we are all like little children in the supreme vision, and just as a baby trusts its mother, we should also have the same unquestioning faith in the higher force. A mother does not need to explain to her child while she is bathing or feeding it because it will not understand her explanations. Similarly, the cosmic force has no need to explain anything to us. If you have faith in the will and the work of the Supreme, this faith alone is enough to guide and protect you. Charity, or Donum, not only means providing material things and financial aid for the poor and underprivileged, it also means helping or serving others in any way required. For example, by offering mental or emotional support. To be truly charitable, one must have a giving, unselfish, and sharing attitude, but of course, not to the extent that you exhaust your own resources. Swami Sivananda calls this Udara Vritti, which means having a large heart. In his word, charity must be spontaneous and unrestrained. Giving must become habitual. You must experience joy in giving. If you give, the whole wealth of the world is yours. Money will come to you. This is immutable, inex inexorable, unrelenting law of nature. Some people do charity and are anxious to see their name published in newspapers. This is Tomasic form of charity. You must give with the right mental attitude and realize God, the ultimate reality, through char charitable deeds. Worship of the Supreme Being or Isfara Pujam should not be misunderstood as pertaining to religion. Sage Pantanjali calls it Isfara Pranidhana or resignation to the Supreme Being. In India, the majority of people do ritualistic puja to their own deity, but that is not the meaning implied here. The external life we lead is but the manifestation of the Supreme. It is the interplay of energy and consciousness. That should not be, that should be remembered constantly. Everything is sacred, not just a puja room, etc. There is a well-known story of Guru Nanak, which illustrates this point. 
He was doing a pilgrimage to Mecca, and just before he reached there, he lay down to rest. A Muslim devotee came by and said, you can't lie like that. Your feet are directed toward the mosque. Guru Nanak to told the devotee that he was a very old man and he was tired. He asked the devotee to kindly move his feet away from the direction of the mosque. However, in whichever direction the Muslim devotee moved Nanak's feet, he still saw the mosque in front of them. This shows the elevated state of Nanak's consciousness. To him, there was not just one place that was not holy or that did not represent the supreme. Similarly, worship or puja should be internal. What is the point of spending hours doing ritualistic puja, offering flowers, kum kum, rice and incense, and chanting mantras, if you cannot have the awareness of the highest reality in your external life? External puja is done to awaken the inner consciousness. But if you still argue with family and friends, cheat others, and cause them pain and suffering, then your puja is, meant, is meaningless. Puja means carrying with your awareness and respect for the subtle force and the supreme in everything. The sixth niyama is listening to discourses of spiritual scriptures, Siddhanta or Siddhanta Vaka Shravana. Traditionally, Siddhanta is specific is a specific section of the Vedas and Vedic Vedantic philosophy. Siddhanta is the culmination of spiritual knowledge collected in a concise form. Listening to spiritual knowledge and to what ancient sages found in their quests and experiences helps develop our higher faculty of knowledge or jnana. It helps us understand the spiritual path and the way in which the spirit unfolds. In India, there is a tradition where people sit together with a person who has spiritual knowledge and discuss matters of the soul. It is called satsang. It is not necessarily that only siddhanta be discussed. You can listen to any spiritual topic. Most people waste time and energy in going to the cinema, etc., which only develops the worldly na nature. Satsang perverts preserves mental and emotional energy, and it keeps one awareness in the realm or of spiritual vibrations and aspirations. I feel like I'm gonna pause here. So we have a few minutes to talk and also give myself a break from reading. <laughs> this was a long one. Yeah. Yeah. So we're at, um, Mo we'll, we'll leave off at modesty for Monday. We'll start Monday with modesty. Great. I think these are important. I don't know why they say they're not important. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know if she said it wasn't important. I think for Hatha Yoga, she said. It's not emphasized with Hatha Yoga. They're like, do all the other practices first. But I don't know. Because, I mean, look at the example of the people who do all the other practices first without the moral understanding it's just it's like a mess yeah yeah this reminds me of that thing uh in the sutras where they talk about people who could well in my head i was hearing it people who could uh levitate themselves and they could do the sort of the the side effects of 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 study but they didn't they didn't get to the core of study um right. so but i you know i i I agree. I think these things are important, and, and uh, I think if if nothing else, the physical practice helps you to be able to focus, to focus, and and to reach a place where you can be more self observant and less judgmental, and get to some of these things, some of these some of these good practices. I love yeah, how much nice. what Amanda? I see, yeah, that makes sense. I love how much time she spent on Brahmacharya because after what you had said the other day about the guru and misusing parts of bodies for sexual <laughs> impulses, I feel like that's the one that me that 
topic is the one that makes people feel most uncomfortable to talk about. So it's sort of like skimmed over and moved on. Like, but I love the way she spoke of it. Like she just outlined it in a more clear way to me. Yeah, that I feel like right. more people need to read. <laughs> I've been practicing ahimsa on my yoga mat when I'm at the park. And I, I hear what you're saying. Like, if I didn't practice ahimsa and I only practice even the physical form of yoga, I go to my mat and I'm in a park, which is not my home, but it's a home to like the bugs. And then an ant will crawl on my mat. And normally I would just like kill it. I don't want to say normally. I hate that word. I'm gonna say before teacher training, when I learned, before I learned Ahimsa, I would just wipe bugs left and right in my house. But now I just let them go as long as they don't, you know, multiply too much. But now I'm on the mat at the park. I, I try not to bother the bugs too much if they're on my mat. I let them practice with me. <laughs> yeah. Practicing with the bugs, yep. It's true. I mean, I, you do become more conscious of it. And so things that I find in the house that I would prefer not to be crawling on me when I'm sleeping at night, I try to get out. Um, except bed bugs, them I show no mercy. Well, mosquitoes are not welcome in near me <laughs> ever. Yeah, but are we actually allowed to be discriminatory in that fashion? I don't mean allowed. I mean, does this, if you carry this to the extreme, should I have called an arrow exterminating and paid a small fortune to get rid of bed bugs last year? Probably no, because not. Even paying someone else to do it is still a himsa. Yeah, exactly. So, but you know what? I, I, I'm not evolved because I feel no guilt and I'm really happy they're gone. Oh yeah. I know that. I mean, I can't so go to the extreme with it, but I am, it's just a more, I'm more mindful of it. But if I didn't have that part of the practice, then I would have purely showed up to the park. And I think then it's just like, I don't know. It's not, not the whole package when you're just showing up to do the physical poses and you're not going to practice the other parts of it. Yep. Yeah. The, the thing that, I mean, what I, what I said about arrow exterminating is kind of ridiculous because there's a phrase in there, which I can't find right now that, talks about the reality of, you know, when he talks about being chair, or she talks about being charitable. Um, and she says, charitable up to the point where you're not depleting your own resources. So I think that's probably true for Ahimsa. You're not going to sit there and let somebody beat up your kid and not intervene. Yeah. And if intervening means you take a, a good right uppercut to them, then you're going to do that because, you know, you don't want your kid to get beat up. So well, the thing that I always found interesting about Ahimsa was the, the idea and I, of not hurting yourself as well, mm. not doing things that are self-damaging, Yeah, which are pretty easy to do, I think. You know, if you're not thinking- in the physical practice. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that, yeah. I mean, you can beat was... yourself up mentally because you can't get into the shape or you can yeah. beat yourself because you can get hurt physically because you're forcing yourself to do things that you shouldn't be doing. So yeah. yeah, Ahimsa's a, a, good, a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was all, it's all um, really interesting. And I agree with Amanda that the Yamas and the Niyamas are, are really important. <laughs> I feel like Amanda, I have to go back and, and write it down because I have to see things. And sometimes when I'm, I'm reading, it doesn't stick in my brain. Yeah. But I feel like in the yoga we learned, like I've learned five yamas and five niyamas. And here she talks about 10 yamas and 10 niyamas. Is she like combining? No, in different traditions, there are more. Oh, I like this one. I like the idea of forgiveness and, and adding these more ones in. Yeah, they're they're all good and they're all important. Yeah, needed. I get the whole sentiment that with Kali Yuga, people are like so mired in illusion, 
that it's hard for them to understand or pick up or practice this stuff, but I don't know. I guess I, I give people more credit than they're due sometimes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maybe we'll stay on time today and start breath and meditation unless anybody else wants to say something. Oh, excuse me. Well, about the mosquitoes, Dharma Mitra, someone asked Dharma Mitra, you know, the guru in the city, uh, what do you do if a mosquito is biting you? And he said, well, you don't drag out its death, you whoop, really quick. <laughs> and then yeah, what if him, it's not, so, what if it's not what? What if it's not biting you? If what it's if it's not biting you? I don't know. Try to fan it outside. I don't know. See, I used to be like that with the mosquitoes, but now they um they eat up Isabella. So even in our house, we spend an inordinate amount of time putting bugs outside. It's like a whole part of the ritual <laughs> of the day. We, we gather them up. We tell them, you, you live outside. You can't live in here. And we bring, we usher them outside. But with the mosquitoes, she like, she's allergic or something. So I feel bad because I don't like her watching death or in any capacity, you know, but we, we clap them. Yeah, we have to make exceptions. I mean, I, I loved her because like I go to extremes with things too. So I remember when I first started learning this, all of this information, because I was brand new to it all. Like I'd be like, well, what happens if I'm walking on the sidewalk? And I, I'm never going to do that extreme in the village where they like sweep the sidewalk before they walk. But I thought that was so cute that they. Yeah, it's sweet. Or even like I walk on my grass all the time, like even with shoes on, usually without. But like thinking about all the little creatures that live there, like it's not like you're doing, per it's not like I'm going out there and stomping. It's yeah. just like I'm going on a walk. I mean, I've had teachers told me it's all about the intention, and she sort of echoed that sentiment. Yeah. If you're intending to cause no harm, that's really important that it's impossible to not always, you know, not cause harm. If you breathe, you're killing microbes. It's just, it's impossible. You're, you have cells dying in your body yeah. all day long. It's just bacterium, and it's impossible. You know, there's a story, though, um, I don't know if this was in the Yoga Sutra, I can't remember the stories from, but there's a sage walking down the road and there's a tiger or something, a big cat, and it's lying on the side of the road starving to death. So he goes over to the cat and he lets the, the tiger eat his arm so it wouldn't starve to death. Oh boy. And then I guess the tiger was actually like God in disguise and then he takes his true form and like stops the cycle of birth and, re and death and rebirth and death for the sage and he becomes he like leaves his body and you know what I mean it's like this I always think about that with the mosquitoes like mm, I know I'm supposed to be letting you feed on our blood but I guess I'm I have more births to work out so I say a little prayer I think the mosquitoes got work to do too on their side I mean they need to find a way to feed on us without making us itch <laughs> 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 gotta, be, gotta be a give and take. I always hope they have a higher birth than the next one. Yeah. Well, they couldn't go much lower, so. I know. And in the back of Akita, they talk about that, that you're not, I don't know. See, it's like, it's, it's so subtle because then people could take responsibility for like mass murders and sociopathic tendencies, but the whole idea is like, we're not even the ones who are choosing the death of that being like the death of that being is predetermined and yeah it's like the universe acting through you and you know because they're talking about war in the Bhagavad Gita and yeah and like him having to kill his cousins was a really hard terrible thing that he didn't want to participate in and he said well you guys are beyond this body you were here before your body and you'll be here after your body. You're not killing the being, you're killing the body. <laughs> I don't know who else thinks so much about mosquitoes dying, but <laughs> it's like a big source. It's the only thing that I like ever kill. So it's a big 
philosophical debate in my mind all the time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have, like, even in my house in North Carolina, like, I have a exterminator come every four times a year, but it's like a maintenance. It's like, I mean, I just have to do it. Like, maybe next life I'll be more involved. I don't know, but we can't have termites on property. They'll eat right, we have the termite guy, too. He puts things outside the house. and Yeah, and we have these things. They're called, I think they're like water bugs, but they look like cockroaches, and they're Ooh. disgusting. Um, so we have to spray, but it's just the environment. I was reading a Buddhist thing about that recently, and they say... Um... It was almost like they put the responsibility on you because back then they didn't have exterminators, you know, it's like, if you don't keep your house clean, if you're not practicing Saucha, then it's your own fault. The bugs got into your house in the first place. You know, so I, was, I think about that as I'm like wiping down every inch of my kitchen every night and all the food Isabel throws on the floor. <laughs> the ants, they do. Well, you can think like, about oh. Ahimsa in terms of, uh, in, in really broad terms, you know, that, that is you as a householder doing, you know, your bit to, to create an environment that is not enticing to a bug, right. you know, that kind of thing. But if you think about it, um, you know, living in a way that doesn't, that does the least amount of hurt to the environment just in general. So using, you know, less electricity and, and uh, you know, riding your bike instead of driving the car, uh, you know, that kind of thing, all of those things, not building your house um, on, on the edge of a sandy cliff, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all of those things, if you think about how you're living, that's Ahimsa too. Yeah. It, it's, it's a, there's, there was a science fiction, well, he's still around, so I shouldn't say it was. There is a science fiction writer who wrote, um, really a series of books about climate change and, and climate change is always referred to in, in a lot of his novels. And his name is Kim Stanley Robinson. He's really very good and he's very entertaining. Um, and he closes one book in a sort of a preachy fashion, which isn't great novel writing, but it, the message basically was Look, if you don't want your house to fall off a cliff, don't build it on the edge of the cliff. You know, if you don't want forest fires in California, then reduce the number of, of people who do certain things and don't allow certain things and use your head, you know, when you're dealing uh, with flammables. You know, it's just, it's a very common sense kind of a, approach. But, I mean, a couple of the fires that are raging now out in California were started really stupidly. Yeah. <laughs> and yet look at how many people have died and how many thousands of acres have burned and how many animals and so on are gone. Uh, and it's not because people didn't sweep leaves up under trees, so. Well, I read that the Native Americans used to, and this is something Aborigines in Australia do as well. Um, they would have controlled burns and yeah. get rid of the brush so that it wouldn't be kindling for a huge forest fire. And they, for some reason, policy-wise in California, stopped that. And it's like the further we get away from these ancient traditions, you know, there's wisdom there. It, it's so silly that we don't... It, and all of it was based on foresight, right? And it was like a natural foresight, not like... I, I perceive this thing directly and the same result happens over and over again, but I'm not going to believe it until like 90 scientists go and, <laughs> and verify it for me. You know, it's like a, a real natural intuition and like an, an innate intelligence that comes from experience and from learning from your elders and the wisdom of your elders. And it's like just so devoid in America. Everyone's all messed up from it yeah. on so many different levels of society. <laughs> it's wild. And that's why there are so many bugs, too. Because we cut down all the trees where the natural habitats are for the bats that eat the bugs, and there's nowhere for the dragonflies to go. You know, the suburbs are so, like, anti-environment. Well, Eric was like, every time I come home, there's, like, a thousand squirrels on our lawn. Because I was outside watching them. I love watching the squirrels eat. They're so cute. But I'm like, because we're the only people that don't maintain their our lawn here, there's 
our house is the only house there's food because everyone else picks up all their, you know, like the, the, we were talking about this the other day, the blowers come every day and make sure there's no leaves on anyone's lawn. Right. And that's terrible for the pollinators. Right? They need a place to kind of hide. They need a place to lay their eggs. It's like nature created these perfect cycles to support all of us. And we are just like so divorced from it. It's wild. We're like, we know better. We know better than nature. <laughs> right, and we don't. It's like a control thing. I'm so, I'm so obsessed with Monty Don. He's this British horticulturist. He has all these um, documentaries and television shows and things like that online um, on the BBC Gardener's World. But he, um, he was talking about this movement in Europe where it was like an assertion of power. These military men felt like if they could control nature, it would like prove to the other men that they were powerful. So they started creating these very controlled gardens that required an inordinate amount of maintenance. Like these lawns are ridiculous. They're from like French nobility. And they would require like slaves to take care of them all the time. And now like, because, you know, we need, we need all these chemicals to keep up with this super unnatural thing that was really just like an assertion of power over nature. And it's gone to such an extreme that like we've destroyed, <laughs> we've destroyed nature. And if you just step away for a minute, right? Like for, if you just like let a house go, like some dilapidated house for 10 years, nature comes right back and it takes it over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Humans are a big problem. <laughs> yeah. But that put us in our place. Lawn maintenance is not a himsa. <laughs> That's a good point, Pam. <laughs> no, a himsa in lawn maintenance. <laughs> Okay, we have to move into breath because it's already 820. I feel like I should have stopped after, I should have stopped reading after the yamas, but yeah, right. live and learn. And now I'm, I'm stealing time from you. I don't mind. <laughs> uh, so we'll, we'll do a few rounds of alternate nostril and then I'll set the timer, but we are running late. So if you do have to set your own timer or pop off, go for Go ahead. So finding a nice, comfortable seat, tall, straight spine. You might need to roll out your shoulders or stretch or rock your ear side to side. I mean, your head side to side. And then choosing to keep your eyes open or gently closing them. Focusing on a spot, whether it's external or internal. Maybe it's the space between your eyebrows. Maybe you're going to watch your breath move up and down the spine. And just begin to deepen the breath in as you inhale through the nose. Fill up the low belly. Expand belly button out. And then exhale, bring belly button down to spine. Air moves up and out through the nose. Two more just like that, inhaling, exhaling. And then letting your left palm rest in your lap, bring your right palm up to your nose. Right thumb closes, right nostril, inhale through your left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close right, exhale left. Inhale left. Close left, exhale right. Inhale right. Close, exhale left. Taking three to five more rounds on your own breath. And your finish will exhale through your left nostril. Begin your meditation. Thank you. 
bringing hands to class. Namaste. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Have a beautiful day and weekend. Yeah, you too. Enjoy.